Well, welcome to this uh, Wilmington Professional video on the Criminal Finance Act. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Jason Collins from Pinson Masons. Jason, do you want to say a little bit about yourself? Mm -hmm. Well, I've been in practice for about 20 years, specialising in the resolution of tax disputes, all sorts of disputes ranging from very technical ones through to allegations of avoidance and, of course, criminal investigations where HMRC says that somebody knew they had a tax liability, didn't pay it, and they want to prosecute them and send them to jail. Now, the Criminal Finance Act came into force in September 2017. Do you want to just tell us the reason for that? Yes, well, uh, I think if you look back over the history of the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a, a lot of focus on the Swiss banking industry in particular, about people having bank accounts in that jurisdiction, relying on banking secrecy and not declaring the fact that they, where the money came from or any income or gains they made on their investments through the, held through that account. Um, and a lot of people ask, how could that possibly go on for so many years, almost on an industrial scale, without anybody being prosecuted for the underlying tax evasion or facilitation of it? Um, and in response to that, the answer by many banks would have been, well, um, if there were individual bankers within the organisation helping people engage in tax evasion, we didn't know about it. It's almost a little bit like the Manuel from Faulty Towers defence of, I, I know nothing. Um, and under the UK's criminal law, it's very difficult to prosecute a company unless you can show that at least very senior management were engaged in the criminal activity. And this new Criminal Finance Act changes everything. But of course, tax evasion has always been illegal. So why do we need this new act? Um, I think to create more corporate responsibility, um, f certainly for the management of large organisations or medium-sized organisations, the question is, are you aware of what's going on within your own business and could someone working for you or otherwise representing you be engaged in helping others to uh, engage in tax evasion? So what are the basic provisions of the Act? Well, there are two components. The first is there is a tax evader, somebody who intentionally doesn't pay the tax that they um, know to be due or would have a devil-may-care attitude to whether it's due. The second component is there is someone who facilitates that, intentionally helps, assists or encourages... That's the, the organisation? That's someone working for a representative of the organisation, intentionally facilitates that tax evasion whilst acting as such a representative. So an employee or a formal agent or, or anyone else providing services for or on behalf of that organisation. If that person engages in the criminal facilitation of tax evasion by another, the organisation also commits a criminal offence. And this is apply UK and worldwide? Uh, it applies to both UK and non-UK taxation. Um, in relation to UK taxation, there is no territorial limits to this whatsoever. So the organisation could be outside the UK, the individual facilitating the evasion could be outside the UK. It would still be an offence because it involves UK taxation. Um, there is also a second offence for non-UK tax evasion, but there does need to be some form of nexus to the UK to invoke our criminal jurisdiction over it. Either the organisation is a UK company or UK partnership, or it has a place of business in the UK, so it could be a foreign entity with a place of business here, or the uh, facilitator engages in any part of the facilitation whilst in the UK. And what sort of organisations are we talking about here? Well, principally, the, the, the highest risk sectors will be professional and financial services. Um, clearly, banks uh, are, are very, uh, very at risk here because they hold people's assets and, and their money and they pay income and gains. Professional advisors help with structuring and giving advice around tax positions or help filing tax returns. They're clearly very high risk, but it applies to all businesses. And actually, one of the things that you should probably think about as a business would be um, you pay out a lot of money into your supply chain. Um, that money will probably represent income in the hands of those companies and individuals that you're paying the money to. Are you comfortable that they're properly paying tax on that and are you comfortable that there's no one working for you that may be helping them to engage in tax evasion? And the big question is always, why would someone help another person engage in tax evasion? And the answer is usually because there's some monetary advantage or some kind of advantage to them. Um, perhaps without tax being paid, the price of the service or the products might go down and therefore create a, an incentive for someone to facilitate. You're always looking for, I suppose, the business equivalent of paying your builder in cash. You know, if, if the builder sort of says, it's £120 if I invoice you, or it's £100 if I don't and you pay me in cash, um, there's clearly an incentive on the part of the person buying those building services to go with the £100 option because it's cheaper for them. And I think you're looking for similar situations similar. in commerce. What about defences? Um, yes, yeah, so the offence works by making you, uh, as a business, kind of your employees and agents are stapled to you for the purposes of the Act. If they engage in this intentional facilitation, 
you automatically commit an offence too. However, you can, as an organisation, advance a defence to say that you had in place such prevention procedures as it was reasonable uh, for an organisation such as yours to have in place. So what should organisations do, being aware of that defence and the offence? Um, well, the first thing, it all starts with, there is statutory guidance published sure. by the government in relation to this offence as to what constitutes good pre prevention procedures, reasonable prevention procedures. Um, and the starting point is to perform a risk assessment. You need to sit there and understand where in your organisation could individuals be facilitating tax evasion. Um, you start with that and that's your inherent risk of this offence. Of course, this will be different for different organisations, that the risk profile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, and, and also the size of the organisation. The smaller you are, the more you know what's going on. The bigger you are, the less you know about what's going, taking place on the ground. So and it needs so to be more systemic. Absolutely, and I think that the, but the key thing is um, identifying those, uh, those areas where there could be tax evasion and, and where someone could facilitate it, and then establish what controls you already have in place to meet that, and that gives you your residual risk rate and risk score. Uh, and are you comfortable with that or do you need to do more in terms of introducing some new procedures and controls into your business? What about training and information for staff? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, clearly this is the, the, the highest risk for you will be members of staff engaging in facilitation. Um, your defence will be to say that actually you start really with a cornerstone policy which is that you have written down somewhere that you are against the facilitation of tax evasion. You know, a written policy, a bit like an anti-bribery and corruption policy or a modern slavery policy where you say that you only want to engage with people who are compliant with their tax obligations and that if you find any misbehaviour in your organisation you will do So a statement of intent. statement of intent. And then from there you train people on what does tax evasion mean, um, what should you do if you think that someone you're dealing with might be engaged in tax evasion, and more fundamentally, what do you do if you think that maybe a colleague of yours might be knowingly helping out someone engaging in tax evasion? Because if they are doing so, you should really be encouraging your staff to blow the whistle to give you protection as a business. So, so there is an ongoing requirement, presumably, it's not just a one-off thing? No, absolutely. It's going to be, uh, your, your procedures probably need to be reviewed from time to time in order to ensure that they're still fit for purpose. And, and you know, keeping awake at the wheel, if you like, and understanding where new risks that might emerge in your business are and, and dealing with them appropriately. And any other comments on procedures that might be required? Um, I think uh, essentially the way we've been approaching it with our client base has been to say try and map your customers and your suppliers to understand where are the most likely tax evaders going to lie um, and then you put additional supervision and scrutiny over the employees or third parties that are dealing with those, those kind of customers and suppliers. Um, that way then you're managing your risk and you can show that if something were to happen and, and bearing in mind a criminal investigation on this will start just because HMRC has got evidence of someone working for you engaged in facilitation and once they're investigating that individual they're investigating you as the organisation as well. Um, so you're not helping them with their inquiries if that were to happen you're, you're actually going into defence mode immediately to say well actually we have the right procedures and look we did try and supervise our highest risk members of staff. You did use the word earlier, reasonable, mm -hmm. so it does depend specifically on the organisation. Yeah, I mean, it depends on a, a very, various factors, the circumstances. I mean, it's a very um, legal way of approaching it. You look at all the circumstances, but the sort of factors that we take into account would be um, the, the risk um, profile. You know, if you're dealing with very, very risky uh, customers or suppliers, you'd probably say the expectation of your procedures would be much stronger. Much stronger. Um, if you're a large organisation, there'll be an expectation your procedures would be tougher because the further the management of the business gets from the people working on the ground, the more, um, the more necessary it is to have good controls in place to make sure you're supervising them properly. And is there any guidance that uh, organisations can look to? Yes, there's statutory guidance, as I mentioned earlier, in relation to the procedures. Um, the legislation also allows HMRC or the Treasury to approve guidance issued by certain professional bodies, representative trade bodies, that type of thing. And there has been, um, well, there, nothing's been officially endorsed just yet, but there are a number of bodies, such as the Chartered Institute of Taxation, uh, Law Society, um, who are all um, looking to put something out which will be endorsed formally. And, of course, the, the banks are doing the same. So, finally, organisations need to be aware of this act and do something about it. Uh, absolutely. It's one of those things where you won't know you have a problem 
uh, until uh, you're under investigation. Uh, no one's going to come in and ask you, how are your procedures? Nobody from HMRC will come in and say, we just need to check to make sure you've got adequate procedures in place to, to deal with the risks of evasion. Um, it will only be if something has happened something and they're under investigation, you're under investigation, and then you'll, it'll be all, you know, all, uh, all hands to the pump to try and establish that you have the right procedures in place. Jason, well, thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, and thank you so much for watching. Thank you.